We are in the home stretch. Thank you. I know it's been a long day, lots of information sitting. Um, uh, our final uh, panel before the Q&A session is a patient panel, and I'd like to introduce three patients who have um, agreed to share their story of their net journey. So please welcome Ruth Castro, John Turturro, and Natalie Voigt. So thank you for agreeing to um, be up front and share your stories. Um, I think that, you know, I've always found that learning from other patients is going to be one of the most beneficial things. Um, when I was first diagnosed, I went to a support group and just meeting other net patients helped me enormously to see a room full of you and um, really give encouragement to each other. Um, and I would say for the newly diagnosed in the room, please come and tug on one of our shirt sleeves and, and um, ask questions and see if we can be a resource for you. Um, so I, we, we learned today that there are many different types of neuroendocrine tumors and um, maybe we can uh, start with you, Ruth, um, since you're in the middle. Um, Ruth is a lung net and um, was diagnosed in 2002. And one of the things I think we will see highlighted here is the importance of being diagnosed early. And the only way we can be diagnosed early is to have that awareness out there. Um, and Ruth, I understand from talking with you that you were originally told this was a tumor that didn't spread. Can you tell us a little about your history? We'll get you some audio. Is it on now? Okay. Yes, you're on. Um, so in 2002, when I was first diagnosed, I actually was told that um, you know, it, was a, it was a cancer, it was slow growing, and there was really nothing to worry about. And the way they found it was basically I ended up in the ER not being able to breathe, and they said it was a tumor. They took it out, and that um, thoracic surgeon said I was going to be referred to an oncologist met with the oncologist, he just kind of gave me a little bit of information about the carcinoid um, cancer, which to me, I was in shock, first of all, that it was a cancer. So he referred me to the radiologist, and the radiologist just basically said, well, you know what, it's such a slow-growing cancer that there's really nothing to worry about. It doesn't spread, it's only going to get bigger, we'll be able to see it. They removed the majority from your lung. Um, I think she said it was in my lymph nodes, but she said, they would just monitor it. So I really went on out the door thinking, perfect, I got the great kind of cancer that's not going to spread, nothing to worry about. Um, so I didn't even really think of myself as a cancer patient. And 10 years later, um, I thought, gosh, it's been 10 years, I guess I'm perfectly cleared. It was like the next day I ended up in the ER again. And it was, um, again, you know, something was happening with my body, I kind of knew something was going on, and it turned out that it had metastasized to my bones. And so from there, it's basically been 2013, um, that I've gone through the bone meds to the liver, and I guess back to the bones, because it's all over the place here and there. But I think the most important thing is, um, it really is a surprise to find out that in 2002, I was told it wasn't gonna go anywhere, and the monitoring wasn't um, done to the best of the, their ability because I know I was referred to a pulmonologist. The pulmonologist basically just said, okay, inhale, exhale, can you breathe? Yes, I can, okay, good. That was it. I mean, they were just really watching um, my lung, never ever thinking anything was happening. But on the other side though, I kept telling my doctor, uh, my primary doctor, you know, I just don't feel well, I feel very tired. Um, they basically said, oh, you know what, it's just your age. And I'm thinking I'm only 38, 39. <laughs> and once I had my two children, um, the first child, you know, I had a couple of aches and pains. And again, like I said, she was born in 2003. And my second one was born in 2006. And so once I had the second one, my doctor was really like, oh, it's just that single mom syndrome. You're just overworked. You know, you have your two kids. And my bones were just really, really aching. And like I said, by the time I ended up in the ER um, and they ran the first test, that's when they thought, okay, you know what, maybe there's something going on. But then they told me it was arthritis. And so I went from being told I had um, lupus, fibromyalgia, rheumatoid arthritis, I saw all these different doctors. And I kept saying, you know what, 
I had cancer. Doesn't anybody think that that could be related to that? No, no, no. It's, this is what it is, you know. And again, I kept going from doctor to doctor. And it wasn't until finally, like I said, when I ended up in the ER and they did some scans and they thought it was still arthritis, they referred me again to an oncologist. And the oncologist even said, oh, I think it's just a really bad case of arthritis. I said, really, in my spine? I'm like only like 40 something. And so he's like, well, we'll just check and see. I think I did my first MRI PET scans and I don't even know what the heck else. And then he comes back and he tells me, oh, you know what, you're right, it is cancer. It has metastasized to your bones. And again, that's when it has just every year there's been something um, going on. And I have, been, I have been to the point where I just feel, sometimes I'm rude with the doctors because I feel like I know my body and I need something checked, I need something done. And I feel sorry for the doctors who you know, are probably here too. So I apologize, I know you're in here. I just feel like I have to say something because um, my dad had prostate cancer and he died of liver cancer and he did the same thing. He kept complaining and complaining that there was something wrong. The doctor kept saying, no, 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 there's nothing wrong. And finally when he did say, hey, you know what, I need a test done, um, he was diagnosed with the liver cancer and four months later he was dead. So to me, I just really feel like you have to be your best advocate. You have to be the one to say, you know, I insist on something being done. Um, give them as, medical, as much medical history as you can. And I even went for second opinions because I really felt like, you know what, I trust what the doctor is saying because I'm a teacher and I feel like you should just trust teachers, doctors, you know, everybody like that. But then I started thinking, you know what, that's not what, uh, I mean, that's what I did and this is in the, the situation that I'm in. And so I just really learned to be a little bit more assertive and um, for new, newly diagnosed, um, back then in 2002, the internet wasn't around as much. Now you could probably just get overloaded with so much information. And I was even told by a doctor, you know, what medical school did you go to, you know, because you start learning so much and you just start getting overloaded. And it's probably just good to just focus um, for a short time on certain things. But groups like this, LACNETS, you know, really has helped me to kind of talk with other people and get that information that I really needed. And um, the more research that I did and getting second opinions, you know, the doctors don't always agree on everything. And so I would go to one doctor, they'd say, okay, this is what the treatment plan should be. I go back to my doctor and they would say, well, I don't always agree with that. You know, maybe we could do this, but not this. And um, I'm still kind of in that situation. You know, there's certain things that I would agree with. And um, you, again, you're, you're, you know your body best. And I've probably gone against some of the things that the doctors have recommended, but I just feel like I know my body and um, I'm going to definitely speak up. And I think that's the best advice that I could give is that you have to have to speak up. You're, you're the one that's in the situation and um, you know, that you're the one that's going to have to deal with the, with the consequences, with the um, choices that you make and your doctors are doing the best um, with the knowledge that they have. But there's so much out there and so much to learn still that I think that you have to really just get as best educated as you can in your particular type of, um, of carcinoid. Because mine was in the lung and like I said, I never expected it to go from the bones to the liver and I don't even know where else it's going. That's such a good point, Ruth, about you really need to be your own advocate and keep asking questions. Um, Maybe, Natalie, would you like to share a bit of your story? We're going ladies first, John. Hi, I have a long and convoluted history, which began back in 1981 when I developed breast cancer. I was 39 years old, and uh, so I had surgery and six weeks of radiation, and I did very well for a long time. Um, I had reconstructive surgery. I had hysterectomy, and then I started having blockage, intestinal blockage, and I started going to the hospital for intestinal blockage, and I did that um, every other year or so, and so by the time we got to um, 2004, they decided they needed to operate on my intestines. So I went in and the surgeon saw a spot when he was doing the operation on my liver. And he was concerned about it, but he didn't want to touch it. So I got out of the hospital after the surgery, but he insisted I have a PET scan. I went for the PET scan and they told me it was a hemangioma. 
So the next year they said they were going to watch it and they did another PET scan and confirmed it was a hemangioma or it was consistent with hemangioma. And we did the ultrasounds for a few years and in 2010 I started having more intestinal blockage. And I had two in one year and then in 2011, late 2011, I went into the hospital with intestinal blockage again and they did a CT scan and they told me I had hundreds of growths in my small intestine and they just didn't know what that was and that there was something wrapped around some major uh, blood vessel and oh, they were just hysterical over it. But they sent me for another PET scan and they said they couldn't figure it out. So my gastroenterologist decided I needed to go see the oncologist. I went to see an oncologist and he said, hmm, you have B-cell lymphoma. So he did all these tests and we did lymph node biopsies and bone marrow biopsies and I did not have lymphoma. So he quit and went into research and I went to another oncologist because I had something that they couldn't figure out. The other oncologist didn't know what to do with me and before I went back to the second visit with him, I went out to dinner with my husband and we were with a group of people he had worked with 30 years ago. I happened to sit across the table from a gentleman who had just come back from Germany with his son and he had been with his son for PRRT at Dr. Baum. So when he started talking about his son and all the symptoms, I'm going, what do you call this? Mm -hmm. And so I went back to the oncologist and I said, could I have neuroendocrine tumors? And he said, oh, you don't want to have that. I said, <laughs> I don't want to have anything, but if I've got it, I think I ought to know. And he said, oh, all right, we'll do some blood work and we'll cross that off. Well, they did the blood work and we didn't cross it off because the, two, the uh, levels were all high. So then he said, well, we need to have some tissue. So you need, I live in Orange County, you need to go to Cedars or a one of a UCLA, those are the only two hospitals that do this. They do a double balloon enteroscopy. So I, I happened to go to Cedars, and uh, Dr. Neil Mann was there at the time, and she was the double balloon goddess. So she went in, and she could not get through, and she decided she was going to solve this riddle. She wanted to go the other way, and she wanted to do this special scan because this was just a mystery to her. And she called me up and said, can you come in? And she said, I've taken this to the tumor board. I'm pretty sure you have a carcinoid. So I, she sent me to see Dr. Nissen, who you heard speak here this morning. And he confirmed that I had an, an Octrea scan. Everything lit up, including the hemangioma on my liver, which I'd now had, and we knew I had, and was only slightly increasing in size each year, but they saw it eight years before. So uh, Dr. Nissen, uh, in January of 2013, did a surgery, removed 39 inches of my small intestine, and did a liver tumor ablation. I had another surgery in July because they then got the one that was wrapped around the vein that was, or the artery that was just about impossible that sent everyone else into convulsions. I have done pretty well, although I continue to have intestinal blockage. I have several hernias. Last summer I had, um, a, showed up on the scan because I get scans. I had a red inflamed area and I needed to have that looked at and they did an ultrasound, they couldn't get anything and finally my dermatologist looked at it and she said, I'm going to get a culture from this. And she did and it turned out to be Pseudomonas and I was on IV antibiotics for six weeks and I just had surgery a month and a half ago. 
because I had my intestines or they had to take out the mesh when I had the infection that was in my abdomen. And so I'm going to be 75 soon and I'm still trucking and I'm going to fight this to the bitter end. And sometimes it's Sometimes it's two steps forward and one step back, but I'm going to keep going. And I learned today, I also, because I had breast cancer, was checked for BRCA1 or 2 because my daughters, I have two, insisted. And I did not have BRCA1 or 2, but I got a call from the University of Washington several years ago, five years ago or so now, and they had identified 30 new genes. I have a check 2 gene mutation which Dr. Annis from Stanford talked about today, as 17% of the people have that have carcinoids. So that was very interesting. I learned that today, being here. And I can't emphasize, like you did, how much these groups mean and how much information you get. Because I have a daughter who inherited this gene, because it is an inherited gene, and I want her to have all the information she can and go early to figure this out before it's a problem and she has to have all the things that I've had and go through what I've gone through. So groups like this are wonderful and Giovanna has done a fabulous job. Well, thank you, Natalie. I think I think many of us share this misdiagnosis, um, years and years of misdiagnosis. I share the, the ER visits with the intestinal blockages, not knowing that that's what they were at the time. Um, so it's great when somebody finally figures out what it is. Thank you. John, would you like to share your story? You have a similar um, to Ruth where you were told um, after your lung surgery, we'll see you in 45 years. We now know that that's maybe not the uh, best advice. So can you share a little bit of your story? Not after these two. No. <laughs> um, yes, I'd be happy to. I, uh, I feel like I know everyone already because you know me. Dr. Hendafar was unable to say this, but I can. I have the right to. I was the case that he presented earlier. So you do know quite a bit about me. And just, uh, I'll, I'll recap it quickly because I too have had the, the great experience of uh, connecting with Giovanna and LACNETS and coming early on uh, to meet patients and caregivers and people who are going through experiencing the same things uh, that we are. And it was enormously helpful to us in the beginning, uh, which is why I'm very happy to share a little bit of my story here with you. Um, so <laughs> professionally, I'm the principal of Tuturo Design Studio, and I'm a teacher as well. I uh, am in the Department of Architecture and Design at COC in Santa Clarita. Uh, and you know, I, I consider myself lucky to have what you called the great cancer, earlier. Uh, I don't know that it's so great, but at least uh, we have hope and it's manageable. And those of you who are newly diagnosed are going to learn that. You're, you're learning it today and you're going to find out more about all your options. Uh, in 2007, I was having uh, years of breathing difficulty and what I thought heartburn and what I thought might be a, uh, a heart condition. So we went to our local ER, and an incidental finding in a chest x-ray showed a tumor in my right lung. And of course, um, you feel like a dump truck has pulled up with a load of gravel and poured it on your head when you get that diagnosis. Um, but I wound up at uh, Cedars for surgery some 14 days later. I had a minimally invasive thoracic surgery which is a little easier on you for recovery and the like. Not everyone is a candidate for this. And then uh, went along with uh, happy-go-lucky for seven years until uh, metastases was found, also in an incidental finding. 
An annual uh, checkup with my doctor revealed elevated uh, liver enzyme numbers. And there it was, a dozen or so tumors in my liver from the size of a dime to a tennis ball. Yikes, yes, exactly. Um, we share a surgeon, of course, Dr. Nicholas Nissen, who is remarkable, and he looked at my scans and he said, oh, I can get 90, 95% of this, maybe 100. And I'm one of the fortunate ones for which surgery was an option. Uh, and of course, you've heard today, debulking and getting surgery from the beginning gives you a better sort of treatment path. It's not essential, it doesn't mean that, you know, you're you're in trouble if you don't get that, but I was fortunate to be able to have a large resection and debulking of my uh, liver. And I've gone on through several treatments since. The somatostatin hormone, uh, an embolization, uh, a trial with pember pembrolizumab, the uh, Keytruda drug, which I failed eventually, but we don't know. There may have been some efficacy. And now back to uh, lanreotide and monthly everlimus, right? PRRT, maybe, eventually. That's a possibility for me. I had a gallium-68 scan that showed very high uptake, uh, so I am a candidate for that. And you, know, you get to know so much about your illness because you have time, and you do have to be your own advocate, as you said. You have to learn, you have to communicate with your doctors, you have to engage in a teamwork process to make it through this. Uh, I'm very fortunate to have uh, the best partner and caregiver who's here today. Not the best, the best is seated over here, apparently. Uh, my lovely wife, Karen. And, and those of you who do have partners or family or caregivers to help you through this process, it's going to mean a, a, a lot in your recovery and dealing with the illness. Uh, I decided early on to treat this as a journey, as an adventure, to learn, to experience it, to not run away from it, to not let it consume me, but to meet it head on in a methodical and intelligent and medical way and to do the best I can to outline a course of treatment that will give me a long and normal life, which I feel like I have. It's been 10 years and I feel terrific and I'm doing everything I want to do. I have little or no restrictions. Uh, you know, the, people don't know we're sick. It's, you come to these uh, conferences and you try to guess who the patients are, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I was with uh, one of my students this past week and in conversation she said, man, I hadn't seen her for some time and she's aware of my condition. And she said, how's the cancer thing going? <laughs> and I said, yeah, it's going really well. <laughs> the cancer thing is going great. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's very different for us. And uh, those of you who, who feel like that truck has just dumped the load of gravel on you, take heart and uh, do your best. And I can tell you from my experience that there's a very good possibility that your experience will be that of a survivor and probably a long-term survivor. So, I'm glad you're here today, and I'm glad to be here with you. I want to see you at about 20, 25 more of these. Shall we? Thank you, John. So, one thing that's really clear is that we're all entirely different. I mean, every story is unique. It's not something where, okay, here's the protocol, everyone gets the same co cookie cutter. Um, and so I wonder if you each might speak a little bit about, do you feel you have the resources that you need and how do you make those decisions? Because each one of you have mentioned some point in your disease where you needed to make a choice, whether it was saying, I'm listening to this doctor or my gut, no pun intended, tells me something else, 
or or just how do you make those decisions? And we, like you're saying, it's it's a marathon. It's over time. Um, we have fortunately we have the time to think about decisions. It's not like you better get there on Tuesday. Um, so maybe you could, starting with Natalie, maybe you could say a word about that. I try to gather as many facts as I can about whatever the decision involves and just analyze them in an intelligent manner and come to a decision that I think will work for me and that I can live with. And what does your fact gathering look like? Um, I gather a lot from the internet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm Google a lot of things and uh, spend quite a lot of time doing that. And I talk to as many professional people as I can uh, who have some knowledge of the subject. The problem I find sometimes is the doctor doesn't know any more than I do about what I have. So we're kind of at an impasse there. Yeah. But I, I try to get information from knowledgeable people and, and attend groups like this because there's always something to be learned. I have learned something from every single event I've gone to. And today I'm especially stoked because I can possibly spare my daughter some mm -hmm. grief. And my mother also has this gene because she's still alive. She's going to be 96 soon. Wow. And I wanted to know if, if you don't inherit the gene, you can't pass it on. So it either came from my mother or my father. So I said, my mother's still alive. Can we figure out which side of the family this came from? And it came from her. She has the gene, but she's never had anything. It doesn't mean you'll get it. It just increases the probability because check two is a checks your DNA. And if there's a mistake, it's supposed to repair it or get rid of it. Uh, if you have a mutation, it doesn't always work, obviously. Uh, well, I'm so glad you made that connection and that Dr. Annis wound up being here today um, for you to hear that in his talk and yeah. meet him. So I can pass that information on to her and hopefully, because she's had a lot of gastrointestinal problems, mm -hmm. which are of unknown, you know, origins. Origin. And I've tried to get her to have certain tests and, you know, when you're a mother of older children, they're not your children anymore, they're adults and they make their own decisions. So sometimes it's like, you know, that's just my mother talking. <laughs> this time she'll listen. So Ruth, you're a mother of younger children. Um, how do you get your information and do you feel like resources are available to you? You know what, there's a lot of resources out there, and I think a lot of times when I do the research, it's just like, you know, you, you could Google everything, right? Um, my thing is just talking to people on forums, you know, or looking at the different forums, what people are saying about particular doctors, research. Um, I know that in Europe certain things are done, so I kind of look what they're doing, thinking, is that going to be coming our way? Is that something that I'd consider? So I think when it comes down to the final decision. I'm a single mom, and so I'm the one that has to make the decisions. My kids are 14 and 11. I don't think they can help me that much. Um, so for me, I, I really just feel like looking at the different resources, doctors, what they're saying. Um, I'm not going to say I, um, what did I say, hospital hop, but I have gone to a couple of, couple of different hospitals trying to get the different opinions. Um, again, I've seen doctors who are um, much older and wiser when it comes to carcinoid. And then there's some that I know are, you know, have just been studying it for a few years, but they're um, fresh ideas. And so I really just try to take a look and balance which one I think is going to work best for me. And, you know, one example for me has been, I have never um, experienced a lot of headaches, so I rarely ever took aspirin. My cabinet is so filled with medications nowadays, but I really feel like I know my body, and so despite being recommended for Finitor 10 milligrams, I decided to go five because I feel I know that if I had gone 10 and experienced a lot of symptoms or side effects, I would have been feeling like, I don't even want to try the five, and I probably would have not. I did the five, I don't feel like if there's that much to it anymore, so I'm, I'm all for the 10 now, but I feel like I need to take that control, and I think the research that I did, again, a lot of people said the same thing too. I looked it up and I said, 
5 versus 10, what's the difference, what are people thinking? I um, went on the forums, asked a couple of different people, and that's what they were telling me. They were saying, you know what, you could go from 10 to 5, um, but if you go from 5 to 10, you're going to probably feel a lot better. And so, again, I, I think it's just a personal choice, but there are plenty of resources and things like this where you're talking with other people. Um, it really just helps because talking with people directly um, in situations like this is best, but again, when you're um, you know, at 8, 9 o'clock putting your kids to bed and all you have is time, you research, and that's what I've been doing. And so, again, I think the Internet is um, a good start. But again, you have to look at you know who's doing, who's saying what, and the t the particular doctors and the people that you're talking with are they patients, are they care are they caregivers, are they researchers, and that's what I based it on. But again, I feel like I know my body um, best and what I could handle and what I could do, and so when it comes to the resources, look them over, um, think about it, do a pro and con, and um, make your decision. Uh, since we've spoken about this as being a longer term thing, which fortunately that's where the good cancer comes from, those comments, um, can you each maybe take 15 seconds and say how do you manage knowing what your disease state is with waking up every day and not being in total anxiety? Or to put it more positively, how do you, um, how do you deal with having the resilience to keep going? Uh, my wife insists upon it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I said earlier, uh, I have treated this as a journey, a learning experience, and sometimes I feel the weight of it. I think we, we all do and will, and it's a, it's a heavy weight, but I don't allow it to creep in. I push it aside immediately and then go back to my living and my learning, and my teaching, and my work, and enjoyment of life. Uh, we have terrific doctors. We're so fortunate here to have the City of Hope, and Cedars, and UCLA, and great institutions, centers of excellence for NASA. Uh, we're very fortunate to be some of the lucky ones who've been diagnosed and who are here. Uh, the spirit part, that's all up to you and your circle of friends and family and faith and whatever keeps you afloat. But you must, you must, and not let that weight uh, feel heavy on your shoulders. There's so much time and so much joy, even with the worst possible uh, diagnosis in this. Uh, most of us will still have time. It's very different than the cancer word. You know, it, there was a a physician who called this cancer upside down. You know, it, it's not approached the same way, it's not treated the same way, it doesn't have the same uh, outcome. So I think that is a hopeful thing for all of us. When I see my mother, who's 90, I just saw her last week, she looks at me and she says, oh, you look great. Are you done with the cancer? They got it. You're done with it. And I say, no, mom, no, not done. Never going to be done. Uh, but we're managing it. We're keeping the pot from boiling over. That's how I look at this. Turn down the gas a little bit and keep the pot from boiling over. Um, that's it for me. Thank you. How about you closing comments on how you keep your resilience and what keeps you going? I have wonderful support as well. My husband has been by my side through it all, and he's with me for every appointment. And he gives me strength to carry on. Um, you know, for me, it's my daughters. You know, they're so young, so um, nobody's going to watch them unless I do. So I have a lot of family support, and they're always just saying, you know, like you said, you look great. I can't believe you have cancer. Um, so I just tell them, you know what, I'm just really just joking. This is no, this is, you know, I just kind of have to laugh it off and just say, yeah, you know, it's no big deal. But the days that I have been in excruciating pain and they have seen me, those are the days where they feel like, oh yeah, that's right, she's got cancer. But it really is that support where um, with their friends, family, um, and, and faith, for me especially, has really kept me going. And I think that's what um, you really have to rely on is um, you know, develop that support group because they will get you through it. I'd add one thing that's unusual about this, and you've probably experienced it. People forget. 
friends, acquaintances, they see you after a few years and they think you look great. You know, it's marvelous. They forget. But right, you you're done so with that. Good. But you look so good is what they say. I think it's so common that um, if you can imagine to before you were diagnosed, imagine someone telling you they had cancer and they had been living with it for however many years. Uh, we can't even think about what it would be like to live knowing you have tumors, especially you know when the, you look at the images and you see um, they're measurable, we're following them. I mean, that entire concept is very strange until you're on this other side of being diagnosed. And then, as we said, we're happy to be bored and stable. So um, it takes a lot of mental energy to stay there. Well, I want to thank all of you for sharing your story. And um, I hope you'll be a resource to the patients in the audience here today, um, because it really helps to share our stories. Thank you so much. So we are wrapping up our day. I'm going to uh, ask for a vote. We have a choice. Of, we have one final panel of Q&A um, with all of our faculty from the afternoon. I'm wondering, would we like to do that 15-minute panel right where we are, or would we like to go out to the reception in, in the grass area where you'll be able to ask some of the doctors questions? So who votes for staying indoors? Pretty much no one? OK, I guess we knew what that was going to be. <laughs> Um, so I want to thank City of Hope for hosting us this year. I want to thank all of the presenters, every single one of the doctors. We are so fortunate to live in an area where we have access to these incredible resources. Thank you to City of Hope, UCLA, and Cedar sinai and our presenters who flew in. Uh, we'll see you next year. And please join us for the reception. Before we move on to something else, I want to bring attention to someone very special who we wouldn't be here without today. Um, she's the whole reason all 250 of us were here today. Um, some of you know her very well, Giovanna. And she's the founder and executive director of LACNETS. Um, being able to work for her is so I'm tr truly grateful every single day. You're such an amazing person. Um, she's created such an amazing resource and network for net patients in the Los Angeles area and around the world. Um, Giovanna, I speak for a lot of people in this room when I say you truly live the Lock Nets mission at each and every single day, advocating for all people affected by nets through education and expanding awareness in the community. You continuously strive to provide the best support and access to NETS information and resources, bringing together NET patients at the same time. I want to honor you for all that you've achieved with LAC NETS and more. Thank you for all that you do every day for the NET community. We are so grateful for you. That was not on the agenda. I'm completely surprised. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Yeah, you're and welcome. Thank you to everyone here. You're all such an inspiration to me.